Yalimadath, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar today. Uh, we're very excited as the INA, the Ismaili Nurses Alliance, to be able to host this webinar. We do have a very special guest joining us today, Dr. Sarah Sabzali, whom we're very happy to have. Uh, before we do go into the webinar, I just wanted to speak to the INA a little bit. For those of you that don't know, the Smiley Nurses Alliance, we do have uh, a large membership of nurses, including a variety of different experiences, different fields, different ages, and we always welcome new members to join us and be able to contribute and participate. And we have webinars that we hold, sessions, um, activities, which of course now are virtual in light of the pandemic. But we like to have opportunities to come together where we can really share our knowledge with one another, be able to share our expertise and really highlight the accomplishments that we've made as nurses, not only within the Ismaili community, but beyond that as well, to be able to celebrate all the work that we've done and highlight all of that in the best way that we can. So we do also have our platforms on social media where you can find us as well as our website, all the information which we will include in the description for the webinar as well. So we do welcome you to join our membership. And if you have any questions or concerns, please do reach out to us uh, on the steering committee here at INA. My name is Noreen Lakani. I am one of the event co-leads on the Ismaili Nurses Alliance steering committee. And on behalf of the INA, we're very, very excited to welcome Dr. Saira Sabzali to be joining us for our webinar today, which is called Burnout to Self-Care. She will be discussing a few topics regarding burnout, um, addressing the impacts on the nursing profession within the light of the pandemic and the current climate that we're in. And a lot of us have been facing the pressures of the current workload, perhaps experiencing burnout and also struggling a little bit to identify the pressures related to that and how we can best incorporate self-care and what that looks like for each of us as it is quite individualized. So uh, we're very excited to have her speak on this as I think that there's a lot for us to learn here. And so without further ado, I will hand it over to our speaker. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Syrah. Thank you so much for that introduction, and I'm so excited to be here with you all. Um, this is such a critical topic, and I'm so um, glad that we're talking about it, because these are the kinds of things that sometimes get swept under the rug, people suffer in silence, um, and so if we can get together and have conversations and, and kind of come up with strategies and tools, it's more likely that we're going to get the support we need, right, as individuals and, and, and as a as a professional community. And so a little bit about myself. Um, my background is in psychology. So I have my PhD in transpersonal psychology. Um, I'm a clinical counselor here in BC. And since the pandemic, I've been working exclusively online. So there's been some changes there. And my passion and my interest, um, really, I have four areas that, that I really love to work in one. Uh, so depression, anxiety, family, harmony, and burnout. Those are my four. And so this is perfect, because burnout is you know, it's just what we're facing. And so um, let's get started. I have a, a presentation. So I'm going to be sharing some slides with you as we go. Um, and so let's go for it. So this is the beginning, um, burnout to self-care. And I picked this picture on purpose. Um, there's moments, right, that you have as a nurse where you know how bad it is, but nobody else maybe knows because it's a quiet hallway or it's your house or it's, you know, somewhere in secret where you have to go and just be like, oh my gosh, how is this going to get better? Um, as health professionals, there's a certain posturing, there's a certain way that we have to show up at work um, and you can't always be honest about what's really going on for you. And so I picked this picture to, to remind us that this is a place to have those conversations about how it has been hard. Um, and it's, for some of us, not getting much easier. Um, and so let's let's go for it. So first question, um, what is burnout? Let's define our terms. It's really important for me. I'm a scholar, I wanna always define my terms. Um, and so burnout is actually a state of chronic stress. Um, and that state of chronic stress leads to physical and emotional exhaustion, cynicism and detachment, 
feelings of ineffectiveness and lack of accomplishment. And the next layer and something that I wanted to make sure that we address in this particular webinar is that some of the people, some of you on this call, some of you watching this presentation are parents as well as nurses. And so, you know, you might be seeing that the burnout is actually taking a toll on you, not only at your job, but also in your family life. Um, and so some of the signs of parental burnout are, you know, you're so exhausted that you can't get out of bed in the morning. Like you just don't have any reason to get up, even though you might have a job or you might have kids just really hard to get out of bed in the morning. Um, you're feeling a bit emotionally detached from your children or your partner. And we saw this a lot at the beginning of the pandemic when nurses um, and other health professionals had to sometimes even isolate in the same home um, and kind of be away from their loved ones. And it's like, at, in order to kind of cope with that, we kind of have to create that emotional distance. And so that, that's one thing. But if that's still going on, where you feel emotionally dis distanced from your children or your spouse, or your, you know, anybody else in your household, then there may be some burnout going on. Um, another, another sign for parents is that you're not really taking any pleasure or joy in parenting. And this is a real change in behavior from you. So you're not just one of those people who just don't really like being a parent anyway. We all, I'm one of those people sometimes like, oh, I don't want to be a parent, but you really like being a parent or you're really involved or invested in your kids. And then suddenly you're not, then you know that, okay, something's going on here. And I think it's really important to, um, look at what's really happening. And so I wanted to share this image with you here. And as you look at this image, you know, when I bring this image up in other burnout workshops, where we're all kind of in a room together, I would ask you, I would ask people in the audience, like, what do you see, right? I would say, what do you see when you look at these pictures? And people will say, I see headaches. I see, um, you know, overwhelm. I see anger. I see crying. I see hard time sleeping, hair loss, you know, like just this overwhelm. And what most people don't notice um, about this image is, is this one here, this one here and this one here, which are um, support, right? Because when we are overwhelmed, when we're just coping, even if there is support around us, we don't notice it right? We don't actually see it. And so there's a difference between coping and thriving, right? And burnout is where we're just coping. We're not thriving. We're not living to our best potential. And I'll talk a little bit about mental health and some definitions as we go forward. Um, but yeah, so look at these pictures and, and think about yourself. Think about when you have been um, burnt out. What does that feel like? And what are some of the emotions that you in particular experience when you're burnt out, right? And, and they may look a bit different. For some of us, it's the sense of lethargy or tiredness. Um, for some of us, it is just kind of just a general blah feeling. And all the things that you usually do for yourself to make yourself feel better just don't work, right? So there's, there's these different things that can be happening um, as you as you get deeper into it. And the thing is, I wish I had like a list and I, and I, <laughs> as a, as a burnout, like specialist kind of, um, you know, there's lots of lists and like checklists, like, do you have these things? And because burnout isn't like a diagnosable clinical condition, um, those lists, like they're kind of like based on what and so what I would encourage you to do is look at yourself look at your own um you know yourself right you know yourself better than anybody else knows you and so look at how are you doing and how do you know that how do you know you're doing okay and how do you know when you're not doing okay one of the big challenges that we have um, especially as helping professionals is our our viewpoint is often outward Right. So our viewpoint is looking at who needs me rather than what do I need. And that's probably what kind of brought you into the profession. You want to help people. Right. When you want to help people, it's about other people. And so it's a real kind of mind shift to go back and say, but what do I need? How am I doing? And unfortunately, most people, many people in the caring professions don't really think about what they need until it's too late. And now they're in crisis. They're in a health crisis, a relationship crisis, an emotional crisis, a financial crisis, right? Some sort of thing blows up. And that's when we start seeing, oh, wait a minute. I need something here that I'm not getting. Um, and so that, so part of today's talk is a chance for all of us to kind of be honest with ourselves and look at what is it that I actually need. And am I giving that to myself or not? And so, yeah, this picture, right? This reminder of how am I feeling? If sleep 
is something that's um, that you're struggling with, that can be kind of a linchpin in, in the whole family of mental health. Because when you're not sleeping, your brain isn't getting a chance to sort. So one of the things, I don't know if you know what this, I, I'm, I'm really, really fascinated with dreams. And one of the things um, that it shows in the research is that while we're dreaming, there's a certain hormone that's created. I can't remember the name of it. And I'm sure all of the medical people on this call might even know the name, but there's a certain um, enzyme that gets created. And, and that enzyme has been linked to um, memory creating memories. And so what we know is that part of the purpose of deep sleep is for the brain to filter out what in the day do I need to hold on to? What do I need to remember? And what do I not really need to hold on to and remember? What can I just let go? And so when you're not getting enough sleep, your brain is not giving getting a chance to just do that sorting, right? And so you have too much. Remember, our brains, like, number one function is actually to filter out data, right? There's so many inputs all the time. And a a well-functioning brain is a brain that can filter out extraneous data, things that you don't need this particular moment for your task at hand. And sleep helps with that. Sleep helps us get that focus and that clarity and what is kind of important for us to bring into the next day. Not sleeping, you don't get that, right? You don't get that rest and rejuvenation that your brain needs. So if sleep is an issue for you, I would say that's your number one. <laughs> if it were me, it'd be my number one priority to get my sleep in order. Um, and there's lots of different ways you can do that. So one of them is I, I, I'm going to talk about tools more at the end. But since we're kind of discussing this now, I'll just throw it in here um, for those who are having challenges with sleep. So there's some things that you can do to what we call increase your sleep hygiene. So sleep hygiene um, means like kind of looking after that time of day when you're sleeping. So you want to have low lighting, right? Um, We're really, our our whole circadian rhythms have been thrown off with all this unnatural lighting. So low lighting, um, not watching things that are really kind of emotionally stimulating before you go to bed. So, you know, kind of like don't watch the news right before bed. Um, Don't watch like shoot them up movies, right? Be be really mindful about the inputs that you're putting in before bed, that they're not too emotionally stimulating because then you get all these these hormones that are rushing through. Um, You want to make sure the room is the right temperature. Um, You want to make sure you could do something that's kind of unwinding at the end of the night. And I mean, these are not new things. You know these things, right? But when you're in the middle of it and like, how do I sleep? It it can be helpful to just kind of have, and you might even want to make a checklist for yourself. I know for myself, some of the things that I really need to have a good night's sleep is I need to be in bed at a certain time. If 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 I past that time, even by 15 or 20 minutes, it affects my whole sleep routine. Um, And so, you know, having a consistent bedtime is really important. Um, I also do a gratitude journal every evening, just before bed. So it's not like pages and pages, I write one or two things that I'm grateful for that day. And that just kind of gets me in that grateful mindset. Um, I might read a little bit of a novel, I don't read self help books, at night, because again, that's stimulating. And that's learning something, I read a novel, a little bit of a novel, and then I kind of like have my bed the way I want it, have the fan on or whatever, and I go to sleep, right? So there's just like we, routines are what's going to help you with burnout. Morning routine, evening routine, critical. Not just like rushing to get to your day, right? But actually having rhythms and routines will help you not get burnt out because you're spending time looking after yourself on a daily basis as just part of what you do. So little side note there, but I think I wanted to mention that piece about sleep. So I want you to take a moment and look at this image here. So this was developed by myself and um, another professional, um, Sohail Thakur, who is a project manager and works a lot with volunteers. And we actually developed this, um, this path to burnout based on not just um, our academic or our professional our professional work, right? What we were looking at is people who are really, really passionate about the work they do, whether paid or unpaid. So volunteers who are, you know, serving in the community um, or people who, who have jobs that they really feel are a calling for them. How do they manage? Because the thing about doing a job that you don't really care about is that you can step away from it and you don't really feel bad, 
right? But with this, if you're in this profession, if you're a nurse, likely you really care about people and you really care about helping. And so you can't just step away. You can't just say, oh, you know, someone else will look after that. And so the, your path to burnout is a little bit different than somebody who's kind of like, eh, about their profession or their, or their job, right? And so let me take you through this um, particular model here. So we, when we start, when we start a new endeavor, um, we start because we're inspired by something. And so I want you to think back to, you know, when you first decided that you wanted to enter this profession, what inspired you, right? What was it that kind of had you start thinking about that? Was it some, some event that happened in your life? Was it um, just a real, a real calling to help people? Is it a family? Is it, is it a, a profession that's there in the family? Um, were you watching Grey's Anatomy and thinking, oh, I want to work with Mick Dreamy, right? Like, what was it that inspired you to become a nurse? Um, and that is the foundation. When we're not clear about what inspired us, it can be really easy to lose um, lose focus on where we're going, right? So it's like when we don't know where we started, it's hard to know, you know, where we're going because we don't know the starting point. So right now, I would encourage you to think about what was it that inspired you to to, to enter this profession. Once you get inspired, um, then we start getting busy, right? We start getting busy. And if you think of other ways that you're involved, so maybe in addition to being a nurse, you're also involved in some other um, volunteer activities in the community. Um, maybe you're doing extra projects at work that you've kind of taken on. There's other things. And each of those things that you've said yes to, there's a moment of inspiration that comes before that where you say, you know, I really want to help or I really think I could make a difference. That's the inspiration. And then you get busy, right? And you get busy and you're, you kind of, get things to start happening and you start having, you know, like seeing action in the world, not just an internal inspiration, but you see action. And then what happens is that you feel this feeling of fulfillment. And that feeling of fulfillment feels so good for us that often at that time we take on more, right? We take on more because it just feels so good. And we feel like, you know, wow, I'm doing this. I'm contributing. I'm helping. So we take on more. Now, this is the moment where the path to burnout is going to go in one of two directions. So if when you're fulfilled and you take on more, you expand your capacity, then you're going to be going up here. If you do not expand your capacity, then you're turning into tired and too much, which is the path to burnout. This is the path to burnout. You started inspired, you got busy, you felt that feeling of fulfillment, you took on more, and then you got tired. And then it became too much. If instead in this moment here, you choose again. So what choose again means is that you remember that original inspiration and you decide what you need to increase your capacity. You may need more self-care. You may need someone to assist you. You may need to expand your team. You may need to say no to some things, right? What do you need to do so that you have what it takes to do what, what, what is asked of you? Because see, here's the thing that what burnout is, is that your, your expectations are this much and your capacity is this much. And so you're full, you're, you're at your wit's end, you're doing everything you can. Whereas when we choose again, we expand our capacity, right? So now my capacity is this much and my tasks are this much. And so I've got that room and it becomes much easier. So that's really critical being able to choose again. And then you'll find yourself getting leadership opportunities, right? Because then see leaders have to be able to do a little bit more than everybody else. They have to have a little bit more bandwidth than everybody else. And if you think about really kind of, um, known or successful leaders, many of them have a really rigorous self-care plan in place. They might not articulate it as a self-care plan, but perhaps they take, you know, really deliberate breaks, holidays. Um, maybe they, you know, go away um, for a weekend. I mean, it's been difficult during this period. It's been very difficult to, to find ways to have breaks, but the high achievers, they're taking breaks. That's the only way they can be high achievers right, is that they're making sure they keep their capacity big by doing that regular self-care. And so that's something that I just want you to think about, you know, what, where are you on this path to burnout? The next thing I wanted to, I love this picture, um, the culture of busyness. And I picked this picture because it's 
I feel like it's a very like oxymoron type of picture. So here's a person and they look calm, right? They're just sitting there still, just relax on the computer. But this is what's going on, right? This is what they're engaging in, this crazy, busy, complicated work that they're doing. And so though you might not look like you're doing much sometimes, the toll that it takes on you mentally is, that, that's what I love about this image, is it reminds you that there's a toll. There's, there's, there's lots more going on than just staring at a screen, right? And I want to take a minute here to talk about the culture of busyness. Um, we live in a society where busyness is celebrated. It's encouraged. Um, people feel like, how are you doing? Oh, I'm so busy. And we say it with pride, right? Because busy means I'm making a contribution and therefore I have value and therefore I'm important in the world because I'm so busy, right? And one of the things we really have to challenge as health professionals, especially as health professionals, is this culture of busyness. Because busyness is unhealthy. Nonstop busyness, go, go, go. And I'm going to show you in a minute um, a model of the stress cycle. Nonstop busyness is not healthy for us. We know this. You know this. I know this. Right? So we have to challenge that culture of busyness. We have to challenge that um, norm of there always has to, I always have to be doing something. You know, when I work with clients as a therapist, sometimes my clients will say to me, oh, you know, you know me, I just can't sit still. And they're so proud of that. Like, oh, I always have to be doing something. I can't sit still. And I say to them, like, that's a problem. Like, that's actually a problem. The fact that you can't sit with your own thoughts and not be, not be stimulated by something else, that you can't just sit there and relax, that tells me something's off. Because we were designed to work and then rest and work and then rest. That's how we were designed. So if you're just work, 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 work and never resting, that's going to take a toll on your body, on your relationships, right? On your mental health, on your psychological health. It can't not. So when, and especially like, I don't work in a hospital, but I've, you know, as a, as a, family member of patients I've been in hospitals and there's this there's this like for those of you who are not there's this like buzz of busyness in hospitals right it's a constant barrage of busyness and so you might not be able to get away from that at work so then in the rest of your life in your personal life make sure there's rest make sure there's space make sure there's quiet make sure there's stillness because otherwise you just can't recuperate right? It might look like everything's fine, but what's happening in your mind is like, go, 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 go. And that's what leads to burnout. So I wanted to show you that picture. And now another picture. Oh, no, not yet. Now another idea. What is mental health? So remember, everyone has mental health, regardless of whether or not you have a mental illness. Everyone has mental health, just like everyone has physical health. Your physical health may be, you know, poor or, or not. Might be, you might be well physically or unwell physically, but we all have physical health. We all have mental health. And mental health is more than just the absence of disease. Mental health, according to the World Health Organization, is actually a state of well-being in which these four um, bullets are hit. So you realize your own potential. You can cope with the normal stresses of life. You can work productively and fruitfully, and you feel like you're able to make a contribution to your community. So mental health is a lot bigger than just not feeling stressed, right? It's about knowing your potential, coping, working, giving back in the community, according to the World Health Organization. Mental illness refers to that diagnosed clinical condition. And so you can have poor mental health and not have a clinical diagnosis. We'll talk about this a little more in a few minutes when I introduce to you the mental health continuum. But before that, this is the picture that I wanted to show you. This is the stress cycle. Um, and this slide actually was taken from my course. I, I teach a course called 12 Weeks to Beat Burnout for Good. Um, and this is one of the, one of the slides um, from that course. And so here we go. What does it look like? When we start, we are getting busy, right? So there's increased busyness, there's less self-care, we're feeling stretched, but we can't say no. And so that goes up and up and up and up for a while until we start getting used to those extreme levels of stress, right? We, we, feel, we feel uncomfortable, uncomfortable, and suddenly we don't feel uncomfortable anymore. Suddenly 
It's like that's just our no, our new normal. And we're highly stressed, but we don't feel it. We don't feel, we just think this is normal. And I'll tell you, I lived like that for such a long time. Highly, highly stressed. But I didn't even know I was stressed. I didn't even know I was overworking. I didn't even know I was over busy. I just thought this is life, right? And then there will be something. I call it the straw that breaks you, right? Something, some event, some illness, some, some trauma, some loss, something will happen and you crash. There'll be this rapid decline and that's when you end up in crisis and burnout. And this is um, Sealy, Sealy stress cycle. It's taken from there. So this is what it looks like. And there's different places along the way that you could do something differently, but really the only place is here, is here. When we're starting to get busy and we know we're stressed, that's when we have an opportunity to, to make a change. Because once you're here in the middle, you don't even know that you're stressed. People around you might say, oh my gosh, how do you do it all? And you're so busy and you're like, I know I can do it all. And then crash, it will happen. And that crash could look like, um, a relationship crisis, like, cause you've just been unavailable to your loved ones. And it, you know, it comes to a head. It could, it's often a physical crisis, a physical health crisis. So your body just says, Nope, we're done. We're done. We are going to put you on your back. So you have to rest. Um, for the next three weeks, you have to be, you have to look after yourself, right? Um, it could be a mental health crisis where suddenly you just, you just, you just can't, you just can't, even though physically you're fine mentally you just cannot anymore we don't want to get there right so we have to make some decisions and one of the things that i've found very helpful is this mental health continuum and so this is developed by the mental health commission of canada and it was developed for first responders um, because just as in the health professions there's stigma right even as health professionals we know there's stigma around mental health in our in the field which is some, I mean, to me, that's sickening, but it's the reality, right? If you, I was, I was talking to somebody who was training to be a doctor, um, a physician and, and telling me, you know, like when I look at their meds and I see Wellbutrin or I see Zoloft or I see these, these particular medications and I know they're for depression or anxiety, I have a judgment about that patient, right? And so for judging our patients, of course, we're going to judge ourselves when we have some mental health sort of crisis. Um, and so this continuum can help a little bit with that stigmatizing way of seeing um, mental health challenges. And so let's say that most of us, most our goal is to be in the green, right? Our goal is to be healthy. Our goal is to have normal fluctuations in mood, sleep patterns. We feel physically well, full of energy. We're performing. We're socially active. That's how we would like to feel. When COVID hit, many people hit the yellow, which is reacting. And so in the yellow, we're nervous, we're irritable, we're sad, having some trouble sleeping, we feel tired or low energy, there's muscle tension, there's headaches, there's procrastination, you're not really connecting to people as much. And this might have happened to you. I know for myself, when COVID first hit, oh, man, I was emptying my closet, I was rearranging my furniture, I was doing all those projects that I'd been putting on hold. And then it kept going. And it kept going and it kept going and it was difficult and we had to do this like weird adjustment thing and many of us are still here many of us are still in the yellow like we haven't really emotionally bounced back yet from from the toll that this has taken and so when you're in the yellow what's required is that now you you actually start recognizing your limits you make sure you get adequate rest and exercise and food and you engage in those healthy coping strategies right this is where you have to make sure you're identifying and minimizing your stressors and so when you're in reacting you can still do it on your own right this is where it's like okay I need to pay attention. I'm noticing the signs. I need to make the changes that I need to make. I need to come to this workshop on burnout so I can get some tools um, and, and figure out what it is that I need to do. If we don't react, I'm um, sorry, respond at this stage, if we don't do something, we will very quickly move into the orange zone. And orange is when you're angry and you're anxious and you're just hopeless and there's this pervasive sadness. Now your sleep is disturbed, right? Now you have constant fatigue and aches and pains. And one thing I want to let you know is in communities, the research shows that in communities where mental health is stigmatized or mental illness is stigmatized, 
people will have physiological symptoms due to mental health challenges. So they'll actually have back pain and headaches and leg pain that doesn't have a physical biological reason. We call that psychosomatizing, right? And so these, these things will happen when we don't, we're not aware that we have to look after our mental health. There'll be social avoidance, withdrawal, presenteeism. And so you might be experiencing this if you're feeling burnt out. Presenteeism is where you're there, but you're not really productive, right? You're, you've just shown up to work, but you're not really doing what needs to be done at work. You're not giving it your all. You know you're not at your best, right? And this is when we need to start like looking outside of ourselves for support. This is where you need to talk to someone. This is where you need to seek help or social support um, rather than withdrawing. And orange is a zone of burnout. And that's why I do these trainings because what, when you're in red, now you're in crisis, right? Now you're gonna need like really, really consistent professional intervention to get you out of the red. So if you can catch yourself when you're in orange or even better when you're in yellow, right? then you just do little things to move yourself back to the green. And one of the things I want you to remember is that sometimes we can't see it. Sometimes I cannot see that I'm in trouble, right? Sometimes I can't see that, but the people around me, they can see it. They can tell, they know something's not okay with me. And so they can say to me, it looks like you're in the orange or the yellow, right? And that's something that we have to take like responsibility for, I think, as a community is watching out for each other. Because remember, when you're in that high stress, you don't even know you're stressed. You don't even know. But the people around you can see it. And so that's a challenge that I would put to you to say, like, who are the one or two people in your life that you're going to keep an eye out on? And let them know when they're going into the yellow or the orange, so that they don't end up in red. Teach them this model. I actually, um, for those who really like this and really want more and want like want something tangible aside from this training, um, I have a free video series on, it's called Burnout Basics. And I teach the mental health continuum and the stress cycle and the path to burnout. And so you can get that for free. So do that. Check out my website, get it for free because, and then pass it to people because people need to know. People need to know that you don't have to live this way. You don't have to suffer, Right. So that's the mental health continuum. The next thing is a solution. And the solution, like I just said, is we have to do it together. We have to. We cannot. We have a a myth in our culture. Um, I call it the myth of the lone wolf, right? So you know those pictures you see of the wolf and he's like howling at the moon and he's like looking so beautiful. So we see, we imagine wolf, that's what I imagine, right? I imagine them big moon and the wolf and he's howling. But that's a myth. Because wolves actually live in packs, right? In order for that lone wolf to get any food, he needs his back, right? And so we've done the same thing. Like we are mammals. We are pair bonding herd-like mammals. It's what we are. We need others. We cannot. um, They they say in, uh, like Jane Goodall talks about, like a, a lone gorilla is a dead gorilla, right? We are mammals and we need each other and we... Like we need, we can't do it alone. Somebody told us some story that by the time you hit this age, you should then be able to live your life alone. It's a lie. It's a lie. We have to do it together. It's the only way. So that's the solution. You might want to ask yourself, um, I, I had this slide up here, so I'll just tell you just for a second, think about what, what is it that motivates you? It's got to be something other than work, right? Is it problem solving? Is it being outside in nature? Is it the arts and beauty? Is it achievement or, you know, physical um, challenges to yourself? You have to find things that motivate you that are not work in order for you to have balance. And that was the questions that one of the questions that came up was, what about balance? And we'll get to that. But before that, I want to talk to you about care and self-care. And I want to show you this picture of the chai. And the reason I want to show you this picture of the chai is because chai is different than um, instant coffee. It's a different story altogether. Chai, traditionally, you steep it, right? You work with it, you stir it, you pay attention to it, and slowly, slowly the flavors come together and you get this beautiful cup, right? It doesn't just, you can't just throw in the tea bag and throw in the milk. You could, but you won't get the same flavors, right? You won't get that same creamy richness. Um, and it's really interesting that Many, 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 many societies around the world have some sort of a tea ceremony or some sort of a tea break. 
And think about that, right? Like traditional societies knew that one or two times in the day, you just need to stop and just spend 10 minutes on yourself drinking a cup of tea. Just need, not, not like wharfing down your Starbucks on the drive to work, not that, right? But actually sitting and stopping and taking a break. It's how our ancestors did it. We've forgotten. And so that's why I like the picture of chai is to remind yourself to stop and actually have a cup of tea. Even if you're a cup of tea, like I just had my peppermint tea, right? Literally tea bag. And stuff. But the point was I sat down at that mug. I sat on my balcony. I looked at the trees and I drank my tea and I didn't allow for interruptions. I didn't have my phone with me, right? To be able to do that, especially um, now, when you're more busy than ever, that break is more bit more important than ever. More important than ever. Even if it feels like hard to find that time, you got to find it. You got to. I want to talk to you about care. So that's self-care, right? That's one idea. There's many, 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 many ideas for self-care. Um, actually, before I get into this care model, talking about the self-care again, is that um, there's this phrase in the field, in my field, in psychology called compassion fatigue. You might've heard it in nursing as well. Compassion fatigue means you, you, you can't care anymore. Like you've got up to here with caring, right? You just, you can't care about one more person. And I was at a conference with Dr. Gabor Mate, who's a physician um, that uh, specialty is in addiction and trauma. And he talked about what, you know, when the question came up, it was a room full 500 therapists and Dr. Mate, and he, um, the question came up about compassion fatigue. And he said, you know what? I don't believe in compassion fatigue. And there's like this, like, <gasps> that went up in the audience, like, what? And he said, compassion fatigue can only happen if you're not compassionate with yourself. Yeah. So if you're burnt out, if you're experiencing compassion fatigue, it's because you haven't been compassionate with yourself. You haven't done your self-care. And self-care doesn't mean a massage or a manicure, right? Self-care means finding little opportunities throughout the day to just breathe, to just be, to be still. Self-care means opening the door and sticking your head outside for three breaths of fresh air every so often. Self-care means actually eating your lunch away from your desk, right? Actually paying attention and not being on your phone as you're eating. That's self-care right? Self-care means waking up a few minutes early so you're not rushing around all morning. That's self-care. And so it doesn't have to be big gestures to yourself. It has to be the little things that you do on a daily basis to make your own life easier. One more thing about the teacup. You know, there's the teacup and then there's the saucer. And one of the things that's really critical to remember is that only you should be drinking from your cup. Only you should be drinking from your cup. So imagine the tea coming into the cup. Any overflow that falls into the saucer, give that to whoever you want. Give that to your patients, give that to your family, give that to everybody else, the overflow. But the, whatever lands in the cup, you keep that for yourself. So that what I'm talking about is, you know, the energy, the capacity that you have, you have to protect it. You have to look after yourself first. And then you'll be much, much much more effective in looking after other people. So how do we care? Four things, connection, authenticity, responsiveness, and excellence. What does this mean? Let's start with connection. So connection is about connecting with yourself, connecting with the other, and connecting with the divine presence, right? So connecting with the self. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone and they're just, they're not there? Like they're just, you can't like, they're nowhere to be found. They're talking or they're listening, but they're not there. That's because they're not connected to themselves, right? They're up in their mind, they're somewhere, but they're not really present with themselves. So that's really number one with caring for ourselves and others is connection to ourselves. And then connection to others, being deliberate about who's filling your tank. They say you're the person, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So who are your five people, right? What do those connections look like? Are they nurturing you? Are they feeding you? Is it reciprocal or is it just draining and draining? <laughs> Well, then maybe it's time to open your mind to different connections and then connection with the divine presence. That's how we remember that our capacity is more than just this mind and this heart, right? That there's other dimensions here that that can also support us that we might not really intellectually understand, but we can feel them. 
authenticity. Just be real. Like, just be real. One of the things people often say about me is like, I love that you're so real, Dr. Syra. Like, that's what they say. And I don't think it's an, a, an achievement. The reason I'm so real is because I crashed and burned and I couldn't put the mask on anymore. Like, I just simply couldn't fake it anymore. Couldn't fake that everything was okay. And, you know, like, that was my crisis. That was my rock bottom. And so that's why I'm real. But I'm encouraging you to get real before you crash. Just get real. Be honest. When somebody is saying, like, are you okay? Is everything okay? Is everything, and you're really not okay? Let them know. Say something. Because people can't read your mind. They can read your body language. They can read your facial expression. They can't read your mind, especially if you're giving them mixed messages. So be real. Responsiveness. This is a really, really important one. So there's a difference between responsiveness and responsibility. Responsibility is where like something's on your shoulders and it's heavy, right? So you have the weight of your patients and you have the weight of your deadlines and you have the weight of your supervisor's expectations and you have the weight of your family expectations. You have the weight of your pet that you look after and you have the weight of like, oh, that course that I want to take and it's like, oh, it's so heavy, right? That's responsibility. It's exhausting. Responsiveness is where it's not about things pounding down on you. It's about being really aware in the moment of what needs your attention. So in this particular moment, oh, my daughter is showing me a drawing and I'm going to respond to that. Oh, in this moment, a text message is coming through from my aunt who's struggling with her in the hospital. Okay, I'm going to respond to that. Okay, in this moment, a client is reaching. I'm going to respond to that. Just one thing at a time and being really present with that one thing and solving that before you move to the next thing. That's responsiveness. And then finally, excellence, right? Why not have excellence in the way that we treat ourselves and the way that we treat others? Just makes sense to me. And so balance, the question is, well, how do we get balance? And I wanna share with you this um, balance wheel. And so it's made up of the six pillars in transpersonal psychology, which are the different areas of our life that need to be in harmony in order for us to feel like we have a rich and fulfilling life. And so there's the emotional, the intellectual, spiritual, creative, community and physical. And community means anything social with others. Physical means how well you're looking after your you're eating and you're sleeping and your physical exercise. Emotional is do you have space and places where you can feel and just release some of those feelings? Intellectual, are you being stimulated? Are you learning something new? Spiritual, do you feel connected to a higher presence? And then creative, and this is something that many people forget about, but we need creative outlets. We need to do things just because for no you know, outcome, but just because creativity is the play of adults right? And the brain needs play to thrive. And so creativity is really important. And so what I would ask a client to do, if you know, you were sitting with me in front of me in a, in a, in my room, we would be talking about the balance wheel, and I would have you actually draw it out. Um, and so I would encourage you to just, you know, take a minute now and just draw it out, whether now or later, for yourself, what does your balance wheel look like? What's out of balance, right? Do you have a really, really small, tiny um, intellectual slice because you're not actually learning anything new right now, you're just in survival mode? Do you have a really, really tiny community slice because you actually haven't been able to be around other people for a while? What does it look like? And once you see what it looks like, what you do is you pick the smallest piece and you add one thing, add one manageable thing you can do to expand that pie piece. Right. So for me, community is a small pie piece for me right now, for many of us, because of the COVID situation. As things are opening up, that's changing. And so having, you know, face to face visits with people is now becoming an option. So my community pie piece is opening a little bit. I know I'm giving you a lot of different ideas and models and concepts, but I want to pack in as much as I can, because Maybe, you know, a week from now, you'll remember the balance wheel. And maybe two years from now, you'll remember the stress cycle, right? I want you to have these resources kind of in your mind. So when you need them, they come up. And so this, this next part is about, okay, what do I do? You need to set boundaries. I need to ask for help. Being able to do both. Setting boundaries is about saying no. And asking for help is about saying yes. And, you know, in my course, we have a whole two weeks on setting boundaries and a whole two weeks on asking for help, right? This takes practice. It takes effort. There's ways to do it that are more, that can be more successful and ways to do it that can be more clumsy. And you've probably experienced some of those, but setting boundaries and asking for help are very, very important. What does setting boundaries mean? It means saying no when you need to say no. 
And only saying yes when you really mean yes. That's what setting boundaries means. Asking for help means not trying to be the lone wolf, recognizing that you're a mammal and you're going to need other mammals. You're going to need other humans. It doesn't make you weak and it doesn't make you unsuccessful. It makes you honest. Setting boundaries and asking for help. You are going to have to have some difficult conversations. You are. And sometimes it might feel, might feel like you're screaming into a microphone and nobody's listening. That's okay. You will find people who hear you. Just need to keep telling, need to keep saying it. I can't handle this. This is too much for me. You need to say it. If you don't say it, your body will force you to shut down eventually. And another, I want to give you two other tools. So you've got the bat. So here, let, let's review. What, what, what tools do we have? Let's review. So we, we did the path to burnout. That's one tool. Remembering the culture of busyness. You remember the stress cycle. You remember the mental health continuum. You remember care and self-care, some of those ideas there, the balance wheel. We quickly talked about setting boundaries and asking for help and having difficult conversations. This one is, I think, the golden one, okay? How old are you feeling? When we're overwhelmed, we regress. <laughs> For those of you who have ever been in therapy, you know that when you're overwhelmed, you regress. Um, when it's too much for you, this child part comes out, right? And so in a particular moment, when you're feeling overwhelmed, ask yourself, how old am I feeling? Am I feeling like a really cranky little eight-year-old? Am I feeling like an overwhelmed four-year-old? Am I feeling like a really lonely and scared three-year-old? Right? What's happening? Do I feel like, you know, the task at hand is too big for me because I'm in grade five and they're asking me to do calculus? What's happening? Do I feel like just throwing a tantrum like a two-year-old? What is happening? When you're reacting in a way that's unex that, that, you, that surprises you, like, oh, no, what did I do there? It's likely because you're not acting your age. It's because you're, there's a part of you, that child part of you has taken over and that's running. That, it's like the child is driving the car. And the grown-ups are nowhere to be seen. So ask yourself that question when you're feeling really, really overwhelmed. How old do I feel right now? And then take some time with that five-year-old, that three-year-old, that eight-year-old, and soothe her or him. How do you soothe her or him? Well, one of the things I do is uh, I color, I do mandala coloring. Sometimes I do arts and crafts. <laughs> Sometimes I have a hot cup of haldi dood. That's like, <laughs> you know what that is, right? How do you do turmeric milk? Um, milk with turmeric and saffron and um, cardamom. And I, I do that because that, that was the drink that was given to me when I was little and I wasn't feeling well. And so I'll make myself a glass of healthy tooth, right? To soothe myself. And so we have to be mindful that there's many voices in our heads, right? And not like in the like, I'm crazy sort of way, but there's different parts of us. There's a part that's ambitious and really driven and wants to go get in the world. And there's a part of us that just wants to chill and just wants to watch, you know, Netflix and relax. And then there's a part of us who's like really interested in, in art and music and ballet and right. There's different parts of us. And so, and, and during this pandemic, and especially for frontline workers, only really one part of you has been in the forefront. And that is the helper part. That's the part that's been in the forefront. It's time to let other parts of you come back, right? It's time to let the, the, the joker, you know, the funny one, let that person come back. Let the playful part of you come back. Let the, you know, traveler in you come back. Things are changing and you don't have to be in this like high stress helper mode any longer, but it's a decision you have to make because everybody around you is not going to want you to make any changes, right? They want things to stay the way they are. But if you're not okay, you need to make some changes. And so the final um, gift or the final tool that I want to share with you is what I call the God box. And this was actually taught to me when I was going through my training program, my master's program, the God box. There are some things that are just too big for you. They're too big for me. They're problems that are unsolvable by one human mind. And those things need to go in the God box. I, this is my God box. This is what it looks like. It's just an old tissue box. And I painted it and I like made some, you know, glued some stuff on. And there's a hole here. 
And what I do, and I, I keep this in my office because I'm a therapist. I work with people sometimes whose problems are unsolvable. And so when I feel that weight and that heaviness for one of my clients, I write it down on a piece of paper. I write down the problem that they have and I put it in the God box. And I say, you know what? Somebody else has to look after this problem. I cannot. I cannot. It's too big for me. And you can put in the God box things about your patients. You can put in the God box things about your family. You can put in the God box anything, your relationship, anything that feels like it's a problem that's just too big for you, put in the God box. See what happens. Let's see what happens. It's somewhere to put it. It's somewhere to put it and you know maybe someone out there will handle things. And so that's the final kind of takeaway gift that I have for you. But for those who are wanting to beat burnout for good, I told you about the course that I'm offering, 12 Weeks to Beat Burnout for Good. You can find it, that more information on that on my website, drsyra.ca. And I also mentioned my Burnout Basics free video series um, that you can also get on the same place, drsyra.ca. So if burnout is your thing and you're struggling with it, these are some of the resources that you can use moving forward if you want to get more than, than just this training. So that's me. That's that's the part of my part of things. Um, I'm now going to pass it back to um, Noreen for some questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. First of all, Dr. Sarah, I think you touched on so many topics that we sometimes recognize, you know, on the surface, um, but we don't fully explore. Uh, you know, we know the feelings. We've all been through it. We've been through the thoughts, but we don't really have uh, words to label them with and we don't fully understand them. So, you know, words like compassion fatigue or understand, understanding the stress cycle or that culture of busyness and moving away from the idea of being a lone wolf or the idea of, you know, we just have to push through, you know, some way we'll make it through the end, however we get there. So I think you've really given us a, a different lens with which to look at what, what burnout really is and also how to identify self-care for ourselves because it is so individualized. So um, I think you really helped to break down what that looks like and identifying the process that can take place within to really find that balance for ourselves because it does look so different. And speaking for myself, I think there's a lot that I will take away from this. So the God box, I think is, is such an amazing idea because you're right. There are some problems that we simply cannot handle ourselves, whether it's a personal problem or a problem we've taken on from those around us and being okay with that idea of giving it in someone else's hands. So, um, that, you know, relating to the to the healthy dude, I think we can all relate to that. So that's something we all have in our arsenal. Um, so I really appreciate all of that. Uh, we did have some questions submitted from our audience here. So we'll get right into those. So the first question we have for you is, how can those in leadership positions foster collective self-care in our workspaces and present or support burnout? So how can those in leadership positions foster collective self-care in our workspaces to prevent and support so people don't burn out? So the first thing I'll say, and, and um, Brene Brown talks about this, she's um, a social science researcher, and she talks about that when the leadership is overextending, you're sending a message to your team. So the first thing that leaders want to look at is, where am I pushing too hard, right? Because you're, you're setting the bar for the team. If you're pushing and pushing and pushing and you're on the verge of burnout all the time, that's what your team is going to think you expect from them, right? And so that's the first thing is doing some self-reflection and saying, okay, what about me? What am I doing? That's the first. The second, as far as collective self-care, um, sometimes it's as simple as... Um, architecture, right? Sometimes it's simple as spaces, having a space for people to sit and eat their lunch, for example. Simple, right? Having a space for people to, like a space away, a room or an area where people can get away and have some quiet time. When I was going through my master's program, we had a, a prayer room in the school and it was just like meditation pillows on the floor and some like low lighting and people could just go in there and have some quiet time right so whatever you can make those physical spaces for people and then encourage people to use them and you use them right role model it show people that you can use these spaces and that helps with that what we call micro self-care that that ongoing daily you know moment by moment opportunities to just stop and be still so that I think would be really important is those physical spaces if you can't make physical spaces make times so 
one of the things before COVID, back at my my children's school, they were teaching um, mindfulness was part of the curriculum and part of the way that they were doing the social emotional learning. And so at 10 o'clock, every day, so recess was like 1020. At 10 o'clock every day, the principal would get on the loudspeaker and say, Okay, everyone it's time for a mindful moment. And then the teachers would talk the children through a five minute guided meditation. Children lie down on the floor, like grade four, grade three, kindergarten, all the kids in the whole school have stopped. They've lied down on the floor and their teachers are talking them through. And my daughter was, when she was in kindergarten, she was explaining it to me. And the teacher would say like, visualize a box and now put all your problems in that box and now visualize a balloon and let that balloon just make that box float away. Something simple, right? But what, what, what they did was they're teaching these children that every day you have to take some time and just stop. And so that's something you could implement. Even if you can't change spaces, you can say, okay, between 1230 and one o'clock, everybody stops. And I know sometimes that's hard to do in healthcare, right? So you might need like three people to be on, everybody else stops, but then maybe you rotate that, right? I think there's ways of being creative with this so that everybody has a chance every day to just pause in the middle of the workday. That's, that's gonna help prevent burnout. And it also sends a message that you understand that it's too much right? What you're doing as nurses is too much. You're doing way more than you were trained for or that you're capable of because the, the resources are so limited and the need is so high right now. And so the leadership needs to acknowledge that and may, and, and kind of mitigate that with some of these small changes. So that's what I would say to that question. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. I think that acknowledgement piece is so understated where it really does go a long way, not only for ourselves to acknowledge the feelings that we are having in terms of the pressure and workload, but also to have that acknowledgement from more of a leadership from your employer themselves to acknowledge that for their staff, I think is pretty understated. And, and it really does go a long way. And that idea of micro self care, I think is is very important as well, because sometimes we approach self care as this very large project, that's something to be solved overnight, and it doesn't happen. So it's a lot of little things. So I think that concept of micro self care is is very important, too. So thank you for for answering that. Um, our next question here is, what is the path of self-care once coping strategies are attempted, but the pressures of the workload continue to mount? Right. So there's two things. So if you remember the path to self-care, pressures can continue to mount. That's okay. But what has to change is your capacity, right? And so what are some ways to expand your capacity? Number one is call in help right? Call in help. Let people know when you can't do something. Like the problem is, right, is that people are going to keep asking you until you say no. <laughs> Human nature. They're going to keep taking from you until you say, okay, now. And so many of us, especially those who are drawn into the helping professions, say no way after we should have. We should have said no a lot earlier. And so if the pressures of the workload continue to mount, you need to talk to your supervisors and say, no, no. We can't do this. We simply can't do this. And it might mean that, you know, I was working with a client around, you know, the, va the vaccines and, and, and the, the different drug stores that were like, you know, delivering. And it's like, sorry, we do not have the capacity to vaccinate 300 people. We can do 50, right? We can't do 300. And it's like just being honest about what's being asked. And because otherwise people will just keep pushing you. If you don't say anything, they'll just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. If you say something and stop, then people have to be kind of creative on how we're going to get the work done, right? And, and that'll force your leadership to become creative when people start saying, no, it's too much. So that's one thing is increase your capacity where you can. And when you cannot increase your capacity any longer, you need to say, stop. I'm sorry. That's where boundary setting becomes really important. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that might be something that a lot of people maybe have a difficult time with or struggle with is, is setting that boundary. I think first and identifying what that boundary is, because, um, you know, I think a lot of us have that mindset of, well, we can do anything. And regardless of what the conditions around us are, when that's really not the case, and that is okay to, to be able to say that. But the second part being being okay with actually setting that boundary and addressing that with, um, you know, upper management or whatever that looks like. So I think that's first important to accept for ourselves and then also to be able to say aloud and set that boundary. So I, that's a, that's an excellent point. And, and you know, the funny thing is, Noreen, like we all understand that you need to fill up a car with gas. We understand that. We understand that you need to charge your cell phone. We understand that. But somehow we don't 
value the recharge of the brain, right? Somehow we don't value the recharge of the body. And so when you consistently don't fill up your tank, you know, as a car, or you don't charge in your battery as a cell phone, you're going to ruin the device eventually. The device will just stop working one day, right? And then it'll be really hard to get it back on board. And this is like, in some ways, a machine that you can only push so far. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to take breaks and you have to be able to, because that thing about, I'm just going to push through and get it done. Sure. But at what cost, right? It's the cost to your physical and mental health in the end. Exactly. Yeah. And I think because it's not as tangible, we can't necessarily see it. And that right. really crux of mental health is that we just were go, go, go until we hit that point where we realize, well, you know, we run ourselves dry. Exactly. And at that point, um, there's a lot of work to do then. But identifying that I think is, is just key, which actually leads into our next question here. At what point should the decision be made to either power through or perhaps leave that job? Great question. So I would say a couple of things to that. The first thing would, I would say is trust your gut because you know yourself better than anybody else knows you, right? You know how much you can handle and when you're getting to your breaking point. And I would say, leave before you get to the breaking point. Don't wait till the breaking point and then leave. Because what happens then is that now you're leaving and you'll feel ashamed because you've fallen apart, right? So before you get to that fall apart stage, that's the time. And it it's, some industries require you to push through at certain times, right? So if you think about, for example, I don't know, counting, there's tax time. And at tax time, everybody pushes through in accounting. You just have to get it done and you work hard and you push through. But after tax time, there's respite, right? There's a little bit of a break and people understand like, okay, I'm going to get a break. If you're pushing through and the break is never coming, then you need to get out of that job, right? And, or, or you need to give yourself breaks, Sometimes it's not the employer's fault. Sometimes it's your responsibility to give yourself the breaks you need after pushing through a big project or a big, you know, a big push. And so, you know yourself, so trust yourself, um, be mindful of the breaking point and stop before you get there is what I would say. Because otherwise, like people end up on disability, right? Because they cannot work anymore because they got to the breaking point and beyond the breaking point and now they're clinically depressed, right? Or they're so anxious that they can't even like leave their house. So that's what I would say from a mental health perspective, watch the line, know where your breaking point is. And as you're getting closer to it, and don't talk to people here, talk to people when you're like, noticing that you're getting there, talk to your the people about how you can increase your capacity, how you can increase support for yourself before you get there. That's what I would say to that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a great point. And I think that when we think about that, there are a couple of things that sometimes hinder us, one being the comparison game, where we know our boundary, but if we look at the person next to us, maybe their boundary is far ahead of ours. And so we feel that need to, to meet their expectations for themselves. So sometimes we get caught in that. And well, and, and then that, that affects the whole culture of the profession, right? If everybody's doing that, if everybody's trying to keep up with the person who's going the hardest, well, then you're, you're, the whole profession gets affected by that. And yeah. so if five people decide to stop running, then maybe another five people will say, oh, wait a minute, maybe we could work in this profession a different way. Maybe it doesn't have to look like that, right? Exactly. It, it's up to us collectively to define how this is going to look as we're all going back to this new world. It's up to us to define that. If we don't define it, they'll just keep asking and asking and asking and we'll be back where we were a year ago, right? Totally overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. I think that we do that for ourselves in setting that boundary and those expectations, but when we do it, it does have that collective impact where we're setting that positive model for everyone else. And in that culture of busyness, where it is the expectation to, to keep going, to keep pushing through, um, that when you have one to a handful of people stepping back and saying, well, this is my boundary, I simply cannot go further than this, then it really does, um, it makes it okay for everyone else to say the same thing. And, and ultimately we're all the better for it, I think. Got it. And, and leadership is lonely, right? Being the one person who's saying, sorry, I can't do that, that's at the beginning, that can feel really uncomfortable, 
right? Because it seems like everybody else is fine, but leadership is lonely. And so when you're the first one to do something or part of the first wave of people to do something, it's going to be uncomfortable. The, the, the image that I have um, is like, you know, cutting a new trail in a forest. Everybody's walking down that trail and they're ending up at the cliff and there's nowhere to go from there, right? And you're saying, I don't want to end up there. Let me figure something else out. But cutting that new trail takes energy, right? It takes effort and it takes persistence. And so when you're making these changes, even in your own life, it's going to be like, you know, that machete and like cutting down the trees on this new path. And once you do it the first time, others will start following you, but somebody's got to start. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that again, today, we've touched on so many important topics, and there's so much to take away from this and unpack for ourselves. So uh, I certainly will be taking a lot of this back and thinking back on it. And I think, you know, um, just on behalf of the INA student committee and our audience today as well, just a really big thank you so much for your time for your insight. Um, I think that, you know, all of these are such important topics. But as we discussed, it's nothing that happens overnight. So it's something that we need to think on a lot and talk with our loved ones about, etc. So really appreciate your time today. And I think that there's there's so much we've learned from you. So uh, a big thank you from all of us. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, everyone. And yelling the